station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Station, we are ready for the event. ABC News, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is ABC News. How do you hear me? ABC News, uh, welcome to the International Space Station. I hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much. Recently, you wrote a very eloquent blog about uh, the fact that in space there are no borders. How has being the space station changed your perspective on the conflict happening on Earth? Well, it actually changed my view completely on, on the entirety of Earth. Uh, I think one thing that I always kind of knew but only realized once I was up here is how small our uh, planet is and how fragile it actually looks from the outside. So if you look down and see like cloud systems and everything uh, on the size of global dimensions, you realize that everything on this planet is connected. Uh, nothing happens independent of each other. So from up here, it, it seems, uh, well, uh, well, in, in a way, uh, like a very bad thing if we humans on earth like uh, well fight wars against each other or treat the environment badly destroy our atmosphere that's very fragile and very thin from the outside so when you see that from the uh, from the outside from a perspective from space it seems like a, a, a very unwise thing to do many of your photographs and the videos that you're sending down are having a big impact on social media Talk to me a little bit about that when you look out the window and see what you see. Well, for me, it's very simple. Uh, I take pictures of things that uh, fascinate me, that I find uh, odd or that I'm curious about, um, and just take pictures for myself and for the people out there that are as curious as, as myself. And I just post them um, and on Twitter, and, uh, and uh, I see that there's a lot, a lot of people out there who are as curious. And, and I think that's because we, we humans, we are a curious species of explorers. And uh, we've done exploration since, well, millions Millions of years, and now suddenly, since 50 years, we have the possibility of doing space flight and explore this whole new environment. And now, basically, I'm the eyes and the ears of uh, all those curious people down there, and I'm glad that I can can uh, well help out with a new perspective. We had the mo one of the most remarkable events in space history happen yesterday. Rosetta arrived at its comet. How important is this to the European Space Agency? Well, this is pretty important in general because, well, it's the first time that a spacecraft uh, well goes into an orbit around a, a comet and uh, maybe even puts a lander on that surface of the comet and, and explores this, uh, well, uh, very unknown celestial body that we don't know much about other than, well, that's what probably brought life to Earth in terms of uh, providing water to our planet and that uh, comet is consists of the same uh, mass, of the same material that actually forms formed uh, our very solar system. So, uh, well, learning more about this comet or comets in general means learning more about our own past. And that's uh, one of the, well, an analogies of, of spaceflight uh, that we see in all aspects of spaceflight. Also up here on the International Space Station, we go out in space, we do experiments, we find out things and bring them back home and learn more about not only space, but our, our very self back home, how we came to existence. And I I think that's a, a very uh, important and uh, well interesting thing for uh, all the humankind. What kind of stepping stone is Rosetta for ESA for future exploration? Well, I guess uh, any of these uh, missions, and Rosetta is a, a very great uh, specimen of these, is a, another stepping stone of exploration out in the solar system. That's what we've done in the past. We've uh, flew out there with robots, uh, robotic probes like, like Rosetta is doing now. And, uh, and the next step uh, after we decided uh, it's worth to go there as humans is, well, we go there ourselves. We see how it is. We explore these uh, areas. And uh, we eventually will, will determine... Uh, 
how far we can go out into space. Uh, well, look at Mars, look at asteroids. Uh, you know that NASA is planning an asteroid mission. Uh, so this is a very big stepping stone towards there because we learn more about those bodies. How do they look like? I mean, nobody's ever seen the surface of a comet close. We don't even know what it is like. Uh, is it hard? Is it soft? Is it icy? Is it uh, like grainy like snow? We don't know. And we will find out uh, at the 11th of November when uh, the Philae lander dispatches from the Rosetta probe and tries to actually land on a comet, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. Uh, even getting there is already a crazy idea, but it worked. And you can see that it's the technical ingenuity of us humans that brings us there. Uh, I mean, looking at this, this amazing journey flying, uh, I think, uh, uh, four billion uh, miles. Uh, right now, Rosetta is on the other side of the sun, principally 240 uh, million, uh, 240 million miles away, and uh, just to get there is so uh, such a difficult task. But it, it worked out, and uh, the comet is so small; uh, it, its gravitational attraction is so small that the orbital speed actually around that uh, that comet is 2.2 miles per hour. It's like less than walking speed. If you compare our orbital speed that we uh, in the International Space Station have around the Earth, is uh, is uh, well 28,000 kilometers an hour. So uh, you can see that uh, just the smallest little snip with my thumb could bring a Rosetta out of this orbit and then send it out into space but uh, it actually made it there and this is uh, an amazing uh, well uh, an outstanding uh, performance of uh, engineering ingenuity you are, are lucky enough to have a spacewalk coming up tell me about your preps for that Well, actually, uh, we prepped uh, for the, the planned spacewalks that were planned later this month, but uh, they were postponed right now because uh, there's still uh, an issue with the suit that we're checking up. Engineers on the ground found that uh, there might be a potential issue with the fuse of one of the batteries. So uh, we postponed these, uh, these spacewalks a little bit later. There's nothing uh, too urgent, too pressing uh, here to go out the door, as we say. And, uh, of course, uh, the important thing is to be safe and to know that the suits are ready. You're having a rather spirited back and forth with uh, Star Trek commander William Shatner. How much fun is that for you to be able to interact with people on Twitter? That's a lot of fun. I really like that, especially from uh, one of the idols that uh, I had when I was a child. And uh, uh, back then, I would have never dreamt of uh, being able to communicate uh, uh, with Commander Shatner, uh, Captain Kirk, uh, while I'm in space and he's on the ground. Uh, that's something, yeah, that if somebody had told me, I would uh, straight away told them they're crazy. And now I can do it. Uh, that's a lot of fun. And you mentioned also on Twitter that you've uh, grown while you're in space. What other changes have you seen? Yeah, uh, you correctly uh, uh, said that uh, I'd grown to the three centimeters. That was, uh, well, it's kind of a normal thing when you're in space because your spine elongates a little bit. Then other changes, like uh, you get like really uh, thick uh, skin on the top of your feet because you don't walk anymore on the ground, but uh, we have those hand and foot holes that you might see around me. And uh, so uh, one way to stabilize right now, you can't see it, but my, my feet are hooked underneath one of these hand holes, and that uh, creates, uh, after a while, a very thick sin skin on the top of the feet so it's kind of funny to see and my last question before you go what's your favorite flip to do in zero g well my, my favorite flip i haven't completely worked out yet but i can I can so, show you a simple one that i can do without destroying any equipment around me but i can tell you it's a lot of fun trying these out on the weekends Thank you very much. This is ABC News over and out. Station, this is Houston ACR. Goodbye. All the best from the International Space Station. That concludes the ABC News portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from CBS News. Station, this is CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. How do you hear me? CBS News, this is Station. I hear you loud and clear. Have a good day. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking time to chat. I, I want to start by offering congratulations to ESA on Rosetta's arrival at 67P. Have you seen any of the pictures yet? Uh, what, what's your impression of that thing? 
Oh yes, I've seen some of the pictures. Friends of mine have uploaded them uh, to me via email, and I would have to say uh, it's amazing to see a comet from this close. Uh, it's it's uh, was, looks completely different than what I imagined. I mean, uh, the shape and the surface and all. So uh, I'm uh, really excited about this uh, this probe there with its 21 scientific instruments. Well, uh, probing not only a comet, but actually uh, the very material that we exist of, that our solar system was made. So it's very exciting to see that for the very first time now, um, well, a man-made object goes into an orbit around uh, a little comet and, and tumbles with it towards the sun and watches it as it changes. And uh, maybe if we are lucky, uh, it even uh, dispatches a lander uh, in November, which lands on the surface and, uh, and well, investigates the very material of that comet for the very first time. So, uh, as you can see, uh, I'm uh, pretty excited about this, and uh, I think everybody else is who is uh, as curious as I am. What, what does it say about the maturity of the European Space Agency that uh, they've been able to put together a mission like Rosetta? I mean, a, a one point, I think it's 1.3 billion euros for this mission. It took 10 years to get there, and it's one of the most technically complex space missions I've ever seen. Uh, what does it say about the maturity of the program? Well, you can uh, pretty much say the program is very mature if we can get there, considering, I mean, can get to this comet, uh, which we did, uh, considering how difficult it actually is. Uh, as you said, it, it launched uh, 10 years ago. It had a journey of more than 4 billion miles behind itself. It had to swing by a planet four times to get to speed, and now it uh, entered an orbit that it had so precisely calculated uh, that even a small snip with the thumb would kind of tumble it out of that orbit because the gravitation attraction of that comet is so weak so that shows a lot and uh, I, I'm not surprised actually if I uh, look at the people working at ESA and uh, same goes for NASA by the way there's so many really people that are fascinated dedicated uh, uh, brilliant engineers brilliant scientists and uh, technicians so uh, Seeing this doesn't surprise me at all, but uh, shows once again that, uh, well, working at the space agency where you work on the forefront of technology, where you work uh, inventing new things uh, that, that have a big impact on society because all those uh, spin-offs on the side uh, really make our daily life better, that this is a great job and uh, it, it, it looks like, uh, well, we, we were successful in activating uh, well, young people to come to our space agencies to help us working on these uh, fantastic projects. Well, you know, as you said, getting there was hard enough, but as you, as you point out, in November they're going to try to land, uh, which strikes me as a, an especially challenging feat given the, the very, very feeble gravity involved. How confident are you that they can pull that off with the lander? Well, when you try something for the very first time and when, you, when it's as daring as, as this uh, project, you never know what happens. Uh, I mean, imagine this. We, we don't even know what the surface of a comet is like. Uh, is it kind of rocky? Is it icy? Is it uh, flaky like snow? How do you hold on to, uh, to a planet uh, or to an object like this, in this case a comet? Uh, we don't know. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> going to be very excited to see that, uh, which is, by the way, exactly one day after I land myself uh, with my uh, U.S. colleague, uh, Reed Weisman, and my Russian colleague, Max Zarev, uh, back on Earth uh, for us it's probably going to be easier than for a little Philae lander to land on uh, on their destination. You know, I was just thinking that as you were answering the question, I was going, you come home right about that time. So that's two big landings for ESA, I guess. That's going to be fun. Um, anything you want to say to your colleagues in uh, Darmstadt at the uh, Operations Control Center that are running running ESA? I know you know a lot of those guys. Any Anything you want to pass along? Oh, thanks for that possibility. Of course, I want to run along. A uh, big kudos uh, for pulling that one off. I mean, I, I'm a physicist myself, so I know how difficult it is. Uh, I mean, uh, a project like this with technology, where the planning started 20 years ago, the launch 10 years ago, uh, the, the the probe was basically off for two years in hibernation, and it's just amazing to see this happen. And like I said, uh, big congratulations. But I'm not surprised knowing these people. I know they're the finest engineers. That, I, that are around. So, uh, well, congrats. Well, you know, you got another big ESA event coming up. You got the final ATV cargo ship getting to the station on August the 12th. Uh, tell me a little bit about your role in that one. You must be looking forward to it. I, I know you told me before launch you were looking forward to getting the magnetic levitator on board to do some science with that. But uh, tell me a little bit about ATV. This is the last one. 
Yes, indeed, it's a big event for us. Uh, I have the honor with my uh, Russian colleague Sasha Skvortsov to actually watch over and monitor the docking uh, of the ATV. Five, which hopefully is not much work for us because ATV does all by itself. It completely autonomously docks at the space station. The astronauts are merely there to check uh, and monitor this process and uh, step in if it's needed. So far, uh, all the previous ATVs uh, worked flawlessly. They docked uh, with the precision of a sub-centimeter. So uh, we're very confident this, this works out. Uh, but of course, we're prepared. And uh, we look forward to that uh, for several reasons. Uh, you also already mentioned that a lot of scientific experiments uh, are in there that I will be actually assembling here in the European Columbus module that gives us, uh, well, a lot of scientific results back to Earth that we can bring back and that is for the benefit of all humans, uh, new materials uh, and uh, new science uh, in all different subjects. Uh, that's exciting. But also we have a lot of food in that vehicle. We have new clothes. So there's a lot of reasons for an astronaut to actually look forward to a, a vehicle like ATV-5. Yeah, you're a, a volcanologist. And, uh, when we talked before lunch, you mentioned you might be able to make some relevant science observations up there if you could get some oblique views of eruption clouds to see how they disperse in the atmosphere. Have you had any luck with that? I mean, any, uh, any observations you've made since you've been there that are, that are striking to you? You know, uh, funny that you mentioned that because I just uh, uh, took a photo today of, an, uh, of a volcano in Indonesia that had a little eruption cloud. Uh, we we had several ones in, in Alaska that we saw with a little plume and in the Andes. So uh, I actually sent all those results to my colleagues at Hamburg University, and uh, I have yet to hear if they can actually... Uh, uh, well, derive some some uh, some relevant info from that data, but to me it looks promising. Of course, that's kind of a side project that we do. I mean, we uh, we float to the cupola once in a while if we have some time in between and take a picture out the window. But uh, uh, most of the time I spend here uh, in in, uh, in the Columbus module. For example, today I will have another scientific experiment, a very big uh, first, which is. Um, controlling uh, a car-sized rover that's uh, located at the Aztec ESA facility in Holland. Uh, we control that from the space station, and it's a combination of human exploration and robotic exploration uh, that might be important for well future missions to Mars, where a crew in Mars orbit controls a rover on the surface, but also for um, applications on Earth, like telerobotics, like a surgery at a remote place on Earth where the surgeon can't come out, uh, you can do telerobotics remotely through a robot uh, that's controlled by a real surgeon uh, back in a hospital somewhere in a, in a big city. Uh, so that's a, a very useful technology that we're trying out here, and it's, uh, it's very challenging. But um, I'm looking forward to actually uh, well doing that and seeing that rover drive down there, uh, controlled by me up here. Well, you know, it's uh, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, I guess. What do you do for fun up there? Is the, is the experience of living on the station in microgravity uh, lived up to your expectations. Uh, just, just curious what life is like up there for you when you're not working on science. Well, it's it's not very hard to have fun here. I have an awesome crew, uh, two people that uh, are right along. Uh, the same kind of humor, the same kind of well topics that we talk about, and uh, so it's it's a lot of fun uh, with just 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 being with them, working with them, and then of course uh, uh, weightlessness has its its treats. I mean, it's uh, totally easy to uh, get from uh, one place to the other. You get used to it really quick, though. But you can do fun things like flips. Uh, maybe I can show you a simple one. We're working sure. on the more advanced ones on the weekends. Sure. Uh, so far, Commander Swanson uh, has the best ones uh, that uh, Reed and I have yet to. Reproduce, but he's had uh, two more months up here in space, so it's kind of a unfair competition. But uh, I can tell you, it is a lot of fun being up here. The uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, your spacewalk's been postponed. I guess there's some battery issues the guys are looking at. Uh, is it your sense that they're going to get this resolved in time for you to do a spacewalk before you come home in November, or this might be something that stretches out a little longer? Oh, with technical issues, you never know how long uh, it takes. And, uh, of course, uh, when you discover something like this, you want to make sure that uh, it's all safe. And uh, uh, so there's checks on the ground. And, well, we don't quite know when that's going to be resolved. And uh, we're confident in the end it will be if that's in our increment or for the next crew. Uh, we'll see. Well, I've got one last question. It's, uh, I guess it's a little bit more serious. I'm just wondering if, uh, if you have given any thought to the political situation on the ground with the increasing tensions that seem to be going on with Ukraine, the Russia, the U.S., uh, your European colleagues. Do you have any, any, any thoughts about how that might ultimately affect space station? 
Well, when you're in space and look down on Earth, and uh, I happen to have this little small Earth right here, and it gives a good perspective of what we see, is like it's a very uh, small, fragile, blue uh, planet, a piece of rock that drifts through the black universe. And uh, if you look at that atmosphere, it's so fragile. It has huge weather systems uh, that cover half the globe. If you look at it from above, you see that everything on this planet is connected to each other. There's nothing independent, nothing that's secluded and can isolate itself from another part. So from up here, it seems kind of crazy to, to fight in general. And I mean, any, uh, any situation uh, on the world where people uh, fight against each other or any situation where we destroy the environment, uh, um, it's, it seems, well, not the right thing to do from up here. And that's a perspective that is important for me to, well, capture and bring back to Earth. Alex, thanks so much for your time. Best of luck with the rest of your increment. Good luck with your landing, and I hope to see you on the ground afterwards. Thank you very much. You're welcome, and all the best from the International Space Station. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you, ABC and CBS News. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.